our next speaker, well, first we're, we're changing a topic altogether. So we're going from, we're going from uh, the basics of immunology uh, uh, and a little bit of immunotherapy now to the gut and the immune system, as promised. And our first speaker in the series, uh, Susan Tottenham, has um, a longstanding interest in the interplay between um, uh, sexually transmitted disease uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the urogenitary um, uh, microbiome. And she'll tell us a bit about her work today. Thank you very much. So my name is Susan Tudnam. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins. And uh, today I'm not going to talk about bugs or organisms that live on us. So we've known for a long time that we are uh, colonized by many different organisms. But new technologies developed in the last 10 to 15 years have enabled us to understand that there are literally trillions of bacteria and other organisms living on our bodies. They uh, colonize our skin. They inhabit our gut, our intestines, and really uh, are living on nearly every crevice of our bodies. Amazingly, we've also started to realize that these organisms can harm us, but may also be critical for our health, and that many of those beneficial effects for our health may be mediated through the immune system. So uh, this uh, very interesting finding that uh, these organisms may be beneficial to our health at the same time as they can harm us has caught the attention not only of scientists and physicians, but also the public, as you can see uh, from these slides. I particularly like this one with the uh, impending cloud of organisms descending on this newborn. So, uh, so there are technical differences between the term microbiota and microbiome, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll use them interchangeably. So the microbiota or microbiome, then, is defined as all of the microbes that we share our bodies with. And uh, that's mostly bacteria, uh, which has been the focus of most of microbiome research, but also other organisms like viruses and fungi. Amazingly, there are actually more bacterial cells on, their bo on our bodies than uh, human cells. So we're at least as much bacteria as we are human. Pretty incredible concept. So uh, what about the makeup of the human microbiota? Well, uh, the first interesting thing is that we each differ. So uh, the microbiota living on my body is very distinct from that living on to, to the one living on yours. So we, we're each very different in our microbiota. Um, and then secondly, amazingly, there are huge differences in the microbiota, not only between individuals, but within the same individual. So, um, so you can see uh, from this plot here, um, this is a plot uh, that basically shows samples taken from a bunch of different patients and is color-coded by where on the patient's body the sample was taken. And so you can see that here in the orange, the bacterial communities inhabiting the mouth are very different from those inhabiting the skin, which are shown in green here, which in turn are very different from those inhabiting the gut or GI tract, which are shown in blue. Um, so the first uh, key concept is that we each differ in our microbiota, and the second key concept is that uh, there are very different microbial communities inhabiting different parts of our bodies that really specialize to optimize the tissue in that uh, environment or niche. Um, so the, the gut microbiome, which is really what we're going to talk about today, is uh, by far the most diverse of any of uh, the microbial sites on the body. And there are over a thousand species that have been found inhabiting the gut. So gut microbiome research actually goes a little uh, back a little bit further than you might realize. Uh, so a germ-free animal is a special, uh, a special animal, in this case mice, which has been uh, raised in special conditions, so it's isolated from the environment and is not colonized with any bacteria. So the first germ-free mice were developed in the 1930s. Um, and actually, long ago, people noticed um, that germ-free mice could eat about 30% more calories than a regular mouse, but not gain weight. So that's pretty fascinating. Why can a, why can a, um, a germ-free mouse eat 30% uh, more calories, but not gain weight? Um, I wish I could do that. 
So, uh, however, when you actually transplant uh, the gut microbiota, so the bacteria living in the gut, uh, from a normal mouse into that germ-free mouse, the germ-free mouse gains weight rapidly. So we've suspected for a long time that the gut microbiota probably plays an important role in nutrition and how we get nutrients out of our food. Um, another interesting study you may have heard about um, sort of extended these findings and uh, took stool from um, paired twins. So these were human twins. One twin was obese and one was lean. And they put stool from those twins into germ-free mice. And very interestingly, they found that uh, the mouse that got stool from the obese twin gained much more weight than the mouse that got stool from the lean twin. So very interesting. Um, this is just showing how much change in fat mass they had. And you can see there's much more um, with the mice that got uh, stool from the obese twin. So uh, very interesting in suggesting that obesity can be a microbiota transmissible trait, at least between humans and mice. Um, so, so this brings us to what do we know about the gut microbiota and health? And there are a few sort of key concepts. So the first, uh, based on that uh, information I told you about the mouse studies and certainly other studies as well, is that we think the gut microbiome helps us to digest food. Um, basically, we think these organisms help us to break down our food, such as dietary fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and help mm -hmm. us absorb those important nutrients. Um, and there's another key concept, which is that the gut microbiome uh, basically is a, is a community of bacteria that flourish and help keep out bad bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, from coming in and colonizing and overgrowing and making us sick. So that's another key concept. And thirdly, really relevant to today, we think that the gut microbiome is probably very important for the functioning of the normal immune system. So first of all, we've, absor we've observed that germ-free mice have a lot of immune system abnormalities. So they don't have the proper number of immune cells. Um, they're not normal in that way. And uh, there's some other interesting studies that suggest this connection too. So one of them uh, I'll highlight is a study where they basically looked at germ-free mice and gave them a flu vaccine. So the regular flu vaccine that you all get. Um, and they found that germ-free mice just don't really make antibodies very well to that flu vaccine, at least early on. Then when they actually gave bacteria back, normal bacteria back to those mice, uh, they found that they uh, had an enhanced immune response. So they made antibodies much better to that flu vaccine. So a really interesting finding there. Um, what about the gut microbiota in disease? Uh, so I just wanted to highlight um, some really exciting work by my mentor, Cindy Sears, and her lab at Johns Hopkins, who found that there may be a connection, although this is still early stages, between the organization of the gut microbiota and some colon cancers. Um, so colon cancer, and this is a picture of a colon cancer here, um, is a huge public health problem. And interestingly, um, the colon, the mucosa of the colon, um, is normally covered by a layer of mucus that protects it from all the bacteria that are in the stool. Um, so it's there, it's free of bacteria, and it keeps those bacteria from contacting the surface of the colon. Um, but uh, Cindy's group found that in about half of all colon cancers, uh, there's a thick uh, complex of bacteria called a biofilm that actually invades through that mucus and touches the surface of the colon, probably causing a lot of inflammation, activating the immune system, and causing other uh, deleterious effects. So um, this is a slide from under the microscope where the bacteria are shown in pink. And you can see that in the tumor cell, uh, there's this, uh, sorry, in the tumor specimen, there's this thick mat of bacteria shown in pink that are invading through and basically touching the surface of the colon. This uh, colon epithelium is shown in the blue here. And you don't see that same finding in normal patients with no tumor. So an interesting uh, connection there. Again, we don't know entirely what this means, but we're investigating it more. Um, what about future directions? Well, um, I think there's a lot of excitement about the role of the microbiota in many different diseases, and I'll give you just a few examples. So will, the micro will microbiota studies um, in the future inform our approach to prevention of disease? Maybe. So I already mentioned that there are studies, and there are other ones as well, suggesting that there may be a connection between the microbiota and how well people respond, or how well at least animals respond to vaccines. Um, secondly, there's been some research that shows that um, the microbiota may impact how plaque develops in our blood vessels and therefore our risk of heart attacks and strokes. Um, will specific bacteria or communities of bacteria help us improve our treatments for disease such as cancer? So this is another one where this is touching on 
the relationship between the microbiota and the immune system. So interestingly, um, in mice, uh, some mice do not respond very well. Some mice with cancer do not respond very well uh, to some of our anti-cancer medications, inclu including some of the new immunotherapeutics. Um, but if you give them back specific types of bacteria, their tumors essentially stop growing. So a really interesting finding that we think is mediated through T cells and the T cell response. Um, but early days, but very interesting there. Will microbiota studies help us to develop individualized medicine? Um, there's an interesting study um, where uh, a group, uh, Zivi et al, actually uh, basically monitored people's blood glucose levels continuously. And then by incorporating microbiota information and other information, we're able to predict uh, what specific foods would make people's blood sugar spike. And that was very different between different individuals. So uh, white bread, for example, made some people's blood sugar spike significantly, but others not. And you were able to predict that by using the gut microbiota information as well as other factors. And lastly, can new sequencing techniques in the microbiota help us to diagnose and prognosticate disease? Um, these new technologies, uh, these se sequencing technologies that we're using um, to study the microbiota uh, have a lot of power in detecting disease as well. And so just one example, at Johns Hopkins, uh, we had a patient who came in, a woman in her 60s, very, very sick. She had multiple lesions, multiple abnormalities in her brain and her spinal cord. They were enlarging and she wasn't improving. And despite all of our testing, we could not figure out what was causing these lesions. And so uh, sort of as a last-ditch effort, she participated in a study where we used next-generation sequencing uh, to try to figure out what could be going on. Is there an infectious agent? And with that, we actually identified uh, that what was causing her problems was tuberculosis. We started her on anti-tuberculosis medications, and she rapidly improved. So there's one concrete example of where these new technologies actually help to save a patient's life. So I think there's a lot of exciting research going on. Um, this is just a graph showing you the number of publications uh, over time. If you just search microbiome in our PubMed, which is sort of a compilation of all of our uh, biomedical uh, articles. And you can see there's been an explosion in recent years. Um, this research really has been largely dependent on NIH funding, uh, so funding, federal funding from the National Institutes of Health who established the Human Microbiome Project. And the first phase of that, um, which really started in 2007, was just to establish what is the baseline um, microbiota, what's the situation in normal individuals. And now we've moved beyond, which I think is very exciting, to really try to understand more um, what is the role of the microbiota in health and disease, um, with the ultimate goal of harnessing the power of microbiota research uh, to improve patient outcomes. And so I hope I've helped to convey some of the excitement um, and the ex interesting things that are happening in microbiome research. I think there's a lot of promise, and I'm happy to take any questions. The first definition of the uh, mucus covering of the colon made me wonder, do you see anything like that in Crohn's disease? So that's an interesting, so the, the role of the microbiota in Crohn's disease is a hugely hot topic that has been studied a lot. Um, now, with, specifically with respect to the biofilm, um, there's a little bit of research on that, but more of it has actually been focused on what is the overall composition of the microbiota in patients with Crohn's disease or, uh, or inflammatory bowel disease. And we certainly have found that there are striking differences. So. Um, the microbiota in patients with inflammatory bowel disease is uh, much less diverse. Um, and then there's specific bacteria, you know, the results are a little bit conflicting, but there's specific bacteria that seems to be increased or decreased um, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease as opposed to normal patients. So I think all of the connections in terms of what that actually means and how we could translate that uh, to patients and uh, things that could actually improve health for patients, that's a long way to go. But certainly, um, initially, we know there, there are significant differences. Well, what aspect of the microbiome does your work uh, focus on? So uh, my research actually is on uh, a very different niche of the microbiome. It's on the vaginal microbiota. Um, and I come at this because I started out being interested in sexually transmitted infections, things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, et cetera. And it turns out um, that uh, the vaginal microbiota um, are very important for the body's, being the body's first line of defense against colonization with these organisms. 
Um, so it turns out uh, that differences in the vaginal microbiota actually predict your risk of acquiring things like gonorrhea or chlamydia if you're exposed to them. So I'm very interested in that, but it's a little beyond the focus of the talk today. So it seems like we're coming to understand that a lot of different things can perturb the microbiota, um, but I wonder if there's any work on types of interventions that can actually stick, like beyond just the changes we can observe with a different diet, the built environment, travel, et cetera, like what sorts of things can actually lead to a permanent change? <laughs> right, so that's a great question. Um, so I will say that there's a lot of promise in microbiome research, um, but in terms of actually moving, so the, the goal, right, is to potentially be able to manipulate the microbiota in a positive way to improve our health. And, um, and so far we're relatively far from that except for one particular example, which I'm sure you may have heard about. But uh, so there, there's a condition, um, or there's the infection called Clostridium difficile. And um, basically what we think happens is that people get antibiotics, um, and those antibiotics uh, basically uh, mess up the microbiota and uh, perturb the microbiota and allow the opportunity for a Clostridium difficile, which is uh, a very nasty bacteria which causes a terrible and often life-threatening diarrhea, to come in, invade that community and overgrow and take over, basically. Um, so, uh, and, and unfortunately, antibiotic therapies um, are somewhat effective, but people often relapse. Um, so as you imagine, giving more antibiotics for something that was kind of caused by antibiotics in the first place is not entirely successful a lot of the time. But what we have found is that uh, fecal microbiota transplant, FMT, so basically taking stool from a healthy person and putting it into uh, the person with recurrent C. diff, the diseased person, is very, very effective. Um, in some studies, up to 90% of people experience um, remission of their symptoms. And that does seem to be sticking. Uh, we're now doing the studies to see how long that microbiota actually uh, stays around from the healthy person. Um, but that's one example where we've actually been able to change the microbiota in a positive way uh, to affect disease. Um, the rest of it, I think uh, we're doing a lot of research um, you know, for, for various reasons. The idea of a stool transplant is maybe um, not that palatable to many, <laughs> understandably. So the, the goal is to really try to come up with targeted uh, therapies, like using a particular strain or species of bacteria that you can then put into the diseased person and, uh, and improve their health. Uh, but we're a long way from that so far. That was actually my question was, is the um, transplant of stools the only way to administer it currently? Um, because I suspect you wouldn't want to do sort of a cross-body immunization of a very specific gut bacteria, um, you know, expose it to the rest of the body because it's very specific to that region. So is, yeah, I guess that was my question. Is right, so, so, so there, I mean, there are a few different variations on this um, transplant of stool, and there, there have been studies looking at uh, just using a combination of bacteria or bacterial spores and transplanting uh, those into a patient that show a lot of promise. Um, but so far, the one that's been the most studied and the most used is really just transplanting, it's a, you know, a not very sophisticated technology, it's really just transplanting stool from a healthy patient into um, a disease patient. But I think everybody's goal is really to make that much more refined um, and transplant uh, certain strains of bacteria uh, that can have positive effects.